Women Race in Class by Angela Y. Davis. Chapter 8. Black Women and the Club Movement. The General Federation of Women's Clubs could have celebrated its 10th birthday in 1900 by taking a stand against racism within its ranks. Unfortunately, its stance was unequivocally pro-racist. The convention's credentials committee decided to exclude the black delegate sent by Boston's Women's Era Club. Among the scores of clubs represented in the Federation, the one club deemed inadmissible carried a mark of distinction which could be claimed by no more than two of the white women's groups. If Cirrhosis and the New England Women's Club were pioneer organizations among white club women, the Women's Era Club, then five years old, was the fruit of black women's first organizing efforts within the club movement. Its representative, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, was known in white club circles in Boston as a cultured woman. She was the wife of a Harvard graduate who became the first black judge in the state of Massachusetts. As the credentials committee informed her, she would be welcomed in the convention as a delegate from the white club to which she also belonged. In this case, of course, she would have been the necessary exception, proving the role of racial segregation within the GFWC. But since Rufin insisted on representing the Black Women's Club, which incidentally had already received a certificate of GFWC membership, she was refused entrance into the convention hall. Moreover, to enforce this ruling, an attempt was made to snatch from her breast the badge which had been handed her. Shortly after the Rufin incident, the Federation's newsletter carried a fictitious story designed to frighten those white women who had protested the racism manifested within their organization. According to Ida B. Wells's account, the article was entitled The Rushing In of Fools, and it described the pitfalls of integrated club life in a certain unnamed city. The president of the unidentified club had invited a black woman whom she had befriended to become a member of her group. But alas, the white woman's daughter fell in love and married the black woman's son, who, like his mother, was so light-complexioned as to be hardly recognizable as black. Yet the article confided he had that invisible drop of black blood, and when the young white wife gave birth to a jet black baby, the shock was so great that she turned her face to the wall and died. While any black person would realize that the story was contrived, the newspapers picked it up and widely disseminated the message that integrated women's clubs would result in the defilement of white womanhood. The first national convention called by black women had taken place five years after the 1890 founding meeting of the General Federation of Women's Clubs. Black women's organizational experiences could be traced back to the pre-Civil War era, and like their white sisters, they had participated in literary societies and benevolent organizations. Their main efforts during that period were associated with the anti-slavery cause. Unlike white women, however, who had also flocked into the abolitionist campaign, black women had been motivated less by considerations of charity or by general moral principles than by the palpable demands of their people's survival. The 1890s were the most difficult years for black people since the abolition of slavery and women naturally felt obligated to join their people's resistance struggle. It was in response to the unchecked wave of lynchings and the indiscriminate sexual abuse of black women that the first black women's club was organized. According to the accepted interpretations, the origins of the white women's general federation go back to the immediate post-war period, when the exclusion of women from the New York Press Club resulted in the organization of a women's club in 1868. 
After the foundings of Cirrhosis in New York, Boston women established the New England Women's Clubs. Thus the trend was set for such a proliferation of clubs in the two leading cities of the Northeast that by 1890 a national federation could be founded. In the brief span of two years, the General Federation of Women's Clubs had acquired 190 affiliates and over 20,000 members. One student of feminist history explains in this way the seemingly magnetic attraction these clubs held for white women. Subjectively, clubs meet the need of middle-class, middle-aged women for leisure activities outside of, but related to, their traditional sphere. There were, it soon became clear, literally millions of women whose lives were not filled up by domestic and religious pursuits. Poorly educated for the most part, unwilling or unable to secure paid employment, they found in club life a solution to their personal dilemma. Black women, North and South, worked outside their homes to a far greater extent than their white counterparts. In 1890, of the four million in the labor force, almost one million were black. Not nearly as many black women were confronted with the domestic void which plagued their white middle-class sisters. Even so, the leadership of the black club movement did not come from the masses of working women. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, for example, was the wife of a Massachusetts judge. What set such women apart from the white club leaders was their consciousness of the need to challenge racism. Indeed, their own familiarity with the routine racism of U.S. society linked them far more intimately to their working-class sisters than did the experience of sexism for white women in the middle classes. Prior to the emergence of the club movement, the first large meeting independently organized by black women was prompted by the racist assaults on the newspaper woman Ida B. Wells. After her newspaper offices in Memphis were destroyed by a mob of racists who oppose her anti-lynching work, Wells decided to take up permanent residence in New York. As she relates in her autobiography, two women were deeply moved upon reading her articles in the New York Age about the lynching of three of her friends and the destruction of her paper. Two colored women remarked on my revelations during a visit with each other, and said they thought that the women of New York and Brooklyn should do something to show appreciation of my work and to protest the treatment which I had received. Victoria Matthews and Maricha Lyons initiated a series of meetings among the women they knew and eventually a committee of 250 women was charged with stirring up sentiment throughout the two cities. Within several months, they had organized an immense meeting, which took place in October 1892 at New York's Lyric Hall. At that rally, Ida B. Wells made a moving presentation on lynching. The hall was crowded. The leading colored women of Boston and Philadelphia had been invited to join in this demonstration, and they came, a brilliant array. Miss Gertrude Mazel of Philadelphia, Miss Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin of Boston, Miss Sarah Garnett, widow of one of our great men, a teacher in the public schools of New York City, Dr. Susan McKinner of Brooklyn, the leading women physician of our race, were all there on the platform, a solid array behind a lonely, homesick girl who was in exile because she had tried to defend the manhood of her race. Ida B. Wells received a good sum of money toward the establishment of another newspaper, and, a sign of the relative affluence of the campaign's leader, a gold brooch in the shape of a pen. In the aftermath of this inspiring rally, the women who had organized it created permanent organizations in Brooklyn and New York, which they called the Women's Loyal Union. According to Ida B. Wells, these were the first club movements among the colored women in this country. 
Boston's Women's Era Club, subsequently banned by the GFWC, was an outgrowth of a meeting called by Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin on the occasion of Ida B. Wells's visit to Boston. Similar meetings addressed by Wells led to permanent clubs in New Bedford, Providence, and Newport, and later in New Haven. In 1893, an anti-lynching speech delivered by Wells in Washington occasioned one of the first public appearances of Mary Church Terrell, who later became the founding president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Ida B. Wells was much more than a drawing card for black women who were recruited into the club movement. She was also an active organizer, initiating and serving as president of the first black women's club in Chicago. After her first anti-lynching tour abroad, she assisted Frederick Douglass in organizing a protest against the 1893 World's Fair. Due to her efforts, a women's committee was organized to raise money for the publication of a brochure to be distributed at the fair entitled The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Exposition. In the aftermath of the Chicago World's Fair, Wells persuaded the women to create a permanent club as black women in the northeastern cities had done. Some of the women recruited by Wells came from Chicago's most affluent black families. Mrs. John Jones, for example, was the wife of the wealthiest colored man in Chicago at that time. It should be noted, however, that this successful businessman had formerly worked on the Underground Railroad and had led the movement to repeal Illinois's black laws. Aside from the women representing the incipient black bourgeoisie and the most prominent women in church and secret society, there were school teachers and housewives and high school girls. Among the almost 300 members of the Chicago Women's Club, in one of their earliest activist endeavors, they raised funds to prosecute a policeman who had killed a black man. The black club women in Chicago were manifestly committed to the struggle for black liberation. The pioneering women's era club in Boston continued the strenuous defense of black people, which Ida B. Wells had urged at their first meeting. When the National Conference of the Unitarian Church refused to pass an anti-lynching resolution, New Era members issued a strong protest in an open letter to one of the leading women of the church. We, the members of the Women's Era Club, believe we speak for the colored women of America. As colored women, we have suffered and do suffer too much to be blind to the suffering of others but naturally we are more keenly alive to our own suffering than to others. We therefore feel that we should be false to ourselves, to our opportunities, and to our race should we keep silent in a case like this. We have endured much and we believe with patience. We have seen our world broken down, our men made fugitives and wanderers of their youth and strength spent in bondage. We ourselves are daily hindered and oppressed in the race of life. We know that every opportunity for advancement, for peace and happiness, will be denied us. Christian men and women absolutely refuse to open their churches to us. Our children are considered legitimate prey for insult. Our young girls can at any time be thrust into foul and filthy cars, and no matter their needs, be refused food and shelter. After referring to the educational and cultural deprivation suffered by black women, the protest letter called for a massive outcry against lynching. In the interest of justice for the good name of our country, we solemnly raise our voice against the horrible crimes of lynch law, and we call upon Christians everywhere to do the same or be branded as sympathizers with the murderers. When the first National Conference of Colored Women convened in Boston in 1895, the black club women were not simply emulating their white counterparts who had federated the club movement five years earlier. 
they had come together to decide upon a strategy of resistance to the current propagandistic assaults on black women and the continued reign of lynch law. Responding to an attack on Ida B. Wells by the pro-lynching president of the Missouri Press Association, the conference delegates protested that insult to Negro womenhood was sent out to the country a unanimous endorsement of the course Wells had pursued in her agitation against lynching. Fanny Barrier Williams, whom white women in Chicago had excluded from their club, summed up the difference between the white club movement and the club movement among her people. Black women, she said, had come to realize that progress includes a great deal more than what is generally meant by the terms culture, education, and contact. The club movement among colored women reaches into the sub-condition of the entire race. The club movement is only one of the many means for the social uplift of a race. The club movement is well-purposed. It is not a fad. It is rather the force of a new intelligence against the old ignorance. The struggle of an enlightened conscience against the whole brood of social miseries born out of the stress and pain of a hated past. While the black women's club movement was emphatically committed to the struggle for black liberation, its middle-class leaders were sometimes unfortunately elitist in their attitudes toward the masses of their people. Fanny Barrier Williams, for example, envisioned the club women as the new intelligence, the enlightened conscience of the race. Among white women, clubs mean the forward movement of the best women in the interest of the best womanhood. Among colored women, the club is the effort of a few competent in behalf of the many incompetent. Prior to the definitive establishment of a national black women's club organization, there was apparently some unfortunate competition among leading club women. Based on the 1895 Boston Conference called by Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, the National Federation of Afro-American Women was founded the same year, electing Margaret Murray Washington as its president. It brought together over 30 clubs, which were active in 12 states. In 1896, the National League of Colored Women was founded in Washington, D.C., with Mary Church Terrell as its president. The competing organizations soon merged, however, forming the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which elected Terrell to its highest office. Over the next several years, Mary Church Terrell and Ida B. Wells would express a mutual hostility within the National Black Club movement. In her autobiography, Wells claims that Terrell was personally responsible for her ex Exclusion from the 1899 convention of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs that was held in Chicago. According to Wells, Terrell's fears about her own re-election as president caused her to exclude the former newspaper women and to minimize during the convention the struggle against lynching which her rival had come to personify. Mary Church Terrell was the daughter of a slave who had received, after the emancipation, a considerable inheritance from his slave master father. Because of her family's wealth, she enjoyed unique educational opportunities. After four years at Oberlin College, Terrell became the third black woman college graduate in the country, and she went on to study at several institutions of higher learning abroad. A high school teacher and later a university professor, Mary Church Terrell became the first black woman appointed to the Board of Education in the District of Columbia. Had she sought personal wealth and fulfillment through a political or academic career, she would undoubtedly have succeeded. But her concern for the collective liberation of her people led her to devote her entire adult life to the struggle for black liberation. More than anyone else, Mary Church Terrell was the driving force that molded the black women's club movement into a powerful political group. While Ida B. Wells was one of Terrell's severest critics, she acknowledged the importance of her role in the club movement. As she pointed out, Miss Terrell was by all odds the best educated woman among us.
Like Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells was born into a family of ex-slaves. When an epidemic of yellow fever claimed the lives of her parents, Wells was still a teenager with five younger sisters and brothers to support. She embarked upon a teaching career as a direct response to this enormous burden. But her personal hardships were not so overwhelming as to prevent her from pursuing a path of anti-racist activism. At the young age of 22, she challenged the racial discrimination she suffered as a railroad traveler by filing suit against the railroad in court. Ten years later, Ida B. Wells was publishing her own newspaper in Memphis, Tennessee, and after three of her friends were murdered by a racist mob, turned the paper into a powerful weapon against lynching. Forced into exile when the racists threatened her life and destroyed her newspaper offices, Wells launched her astoundingly effective crusade against lynching. Calling upon black and white alike to massively oppose the reign of lynch law, she traveled from city to city and town to town all over the United States. Her tours abroad encouraged Europeans to organize solidarity campaigns against the lynching of black people in the United States. Two decades later, at the age of 57, Ida B. Wells rushed to the scene of the East St. Louis riot. When she was 63 years old, she conducted an investigation into a mob attack by racists in Arkansas and on the eve of her death she was as militant as ever, leading a black women's demonstration against the segregationist policies of a major Chicago hotel. In her protracted crusade against lynching, Ida B. Wells had become an expert at agitation confrontation tactics, but few could equal Mary Church Terrell as an advocate of black liberation through the written word and spoken word. She sought freedom for her people through logic and persuasion. An eloquent writer, a powerful orator, and a master at the art of debate, Terrell waged persistent and principled defenses of black equality and women's suffrage, as well as the rights of working people. Like Ida B. Wells, she was active up to the year of her death, at the age of 90. In one of her last defiant gestures against racism, she marched in a Washington, D.C. picket line when she was 89 years old. Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell were unquestionably the two outstanding black women of their era. Their personal feud, which spanned several decades, was a tragic thread within the history of the black women's club movement. While their separate accomplishments were monumental, their united efforts could have really moved mountains for their sisters and for their people as a whole.